as I was praying, I was thinking about this. God was just speaking, but on my desk, I have a glass surface. And under there, I have many different things that just kind of make up who I am. There's a chart of when the meteor showers are supposed to strike for the main part of the year, when they will reach a peaks. But there's also little cartoons that I have cut out that kind of just make me chuckle and make me laugh. They kind of go against the flow sometimes, too. They're odd and ordinary. And the one that got my attention was from the 90s. I know we all get the Patriot probably. And there's a little um, magazine type thing in there called The Parade. And they have little goofy cartoons in there from time to time. And one I cut out when I was in high school has an image of an office. And in this office is a set of cubicles. And outside of this cubicle, this man dragged his desk. He has one of those old rotary phones that sit on the corner. You can see the cord line going all the way back into the, his cubicle, which most teenagers or children today probably have no idea what a phone cord is, <laughs> or much less how a rotary phone works. But there this man is sitting on his chair, and there's a co-worker right in front of his desk. And as he's sitting outside the cubicle, cats are underneath and says, I prefer to work outside the box. He preferred to walk out, work outside of his box. And as I was doing a little bit of studying, and I'm sure we all know what a box is, but we'll all get, um, if you want to say, scholarly today and see what Mr. Webster had to say. But he actually didn't say anything. He wrote this. And in his Merriam-Webster online dictionary, they wrote, a box is a rigid, typically rectangular container with or without a lid. How shocking. But it can also be a cop. And this past summer, me and Sister Beth moved, and we had all kinds of boxes. We had big boxes. I mean, boxes that were lay wide and sat gay high, full of box dishes and pots and pans. And of course, where there's more breakable stuff, you got the banana boxes and the plates. And you held the bottom because you were afraid they were going to fall out. And then you had more longer boxes. And one thing I learned was you don't put a lot of box uh, books in a big box. <laughs> But there were all kinds of boxes. And I was sitting in, at, in the break room at work in, in National Geographic. They were talking about a box that would be the find of a century. Probably the most famous box today that we are aware of is King Tut's, his coffin. It was the archaeological find of the century. And there in National Geographic, they were talking about King Tut. But rather, they were writing that if someone would find Cleopatra's tomb, it would be the find of the century. Boxes. Today I want to preach on the box. And we bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that you brought us into your house once more. I pray that you just anoint me and allow your words to come forth from my mouth, Lord. But even greater still, Lord, we pray that you would anoint each one of our hearts and our minds, that your word would take root in our hearts and our minds, that we may meditate upon it, and that we would take it with us, that we may think about it, Lord, that we would grow more in love with you than ever before and realize the work that you've done for us. And we praise you for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do in your name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. But Cleopatra's box would be the find of probably the archaeological centuries. But rather, when we look in Scripture, there exists a box that the world today even knows. If we would turn to Exodus chapter 25, Exodus 25, and we'll be reading from verses 10 through 21. Exodus 25, verses 10 through 21. <coughs> Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 21. And the scriptures read, And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it. 
and thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about, and thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staffs of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staffs into the rings of the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. The staff shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. Thou shalt put it into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half shall thou be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten works, that shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shalt thou make of the cherubs, cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings of on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one toward one to another, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cher cherubim be. Here we have one of the most famous boxes in all of history. It is the most famous box in all of Jewish history. It is none other than the box that is known as the Ark of the Covenant. It is the most precious piece of furniture that was housed in both the tabernacle and all of the temples. It was there where God's mercy and His glory would dwell. But there was something special about that box. It housed something. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4, Scripture states, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. The tables of the covenant being nothing more than the Ten Commandments that God had received from Moses. But as we look at the Ark of the Covenant, what was inside the box? Here we have a box. And it contains a few things. Just like the Ark of the Covenant did. Now be not fooled, these are not genuine artifacts, but rather they represent those things that the ark actually contained. And the very first thing we find mentioned is a golden pot of manna. As we look at this pot, it was a remembrance of what God had done for them. He made a provision for them in the middle of the desert. When they thought that there was no hope, God provided food. Where there was starvation, God prov provided nourishment. And as we look at the golden pot of manna, it reminds us that God is above all gods. See, gold is the color of deity. And it reminds us that God is a royal God. He is the God that Isaiah saw. There, in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. There it is a symbol that he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But even greater than that, he is a God above all gods. Second Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 5 states, And the house which I built is great. Solomon here is speaking. But he said, For great is our God above all all gods. The psalmist David wrote in Psalm 95 verse 3, For the Lord is a great God and a king above all gods. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords this morning. And as we look at the golden pot there, it reminds us of exactly that. 
We can look back in 1 Samuel, I believe it's chapter 5, where the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they took them and placed them in the temple of Dagon. There we can assume that they were going to worship Jehovah like they did all their other gods. He was just another captive god, but if Israel worshipped him, he was a god to be worshipped. But well, there was again, as they were placed there in Dagon, God made a statement. He said, I cannot contain myself through the house of another God. Either he is going to be your God, or I'm going to be your God. And there we find the God Dagon on his face in three different accounts. On two times, the priest of Dagon lifted him up, and on each time, God knocked him down. God shows us and reminds us through the golden pox. That I am the God of all gods, and there is none like me. But even greater still, that golden pot of manna. And we look back at the Ark of the Covenant, it contained precious artifacts, but they were not relevant for that day, for they all had their place in time. And the myth. Pot of manna was no longer good, but rather it was just a symbol to remind them of God's provision and His blessing in the wilderness. It wasn't something that reminded them that, hey, God is blessing me now. No, it was God provided and blessed you back in the wilderness. It was God provided for our family and our ancestors. You know, so many times we look into our boxes and we see God's past provisions. Perhaps he provided for us financially, Sister Jan. I remember you and um, Joey telling me when he first got married, he didn't have a refrigerator, but rather it was just a simple igloo cooler on the back porch. But I'm sure if you look in your kitchen today, you probably have a refrigerator. And perhaps one step further, a freezer. You know, we can look back at that box and see what God has provided for us financially. Maybe he provided for us spiritually, brother Vince. You know, he brought us all of than we ever dreamed of. We, he brought, took us all from a horrible pit of despair, of sin. And he took us all to a high plateau there called Mount Calvary. And there our burdens all rolled away as we asked for forgiveness of sin. And there he shed his blood and he applied to our life and said, you know what? Your sins are forgiven. But those are all past events. Perhaps he provided for us physically. Perhaps we had an ailment. Maybe we know somebody in our family who was lame or deaf or dumb or blind. And God provided sight or healing or something instantaneous. And it was done and we can think back and say, you know what? God provided in such a miraculous way back then. I'm reminded reading of our early history of the church here, Brother Jim. And somewhere, I don't know if it still exists, but there was supposed to be a record of everyone that was healed miraculously and what they were healed from. That's not a current list, but it's something from the past. And if we would look at that today, we can think about things that God did for us in the past. See, that golden pot of manna, it didn't provide the food for today. It didn't provide nourishment for today. It was just a reminder God was making a statement. Remember those things which was done for you in the past. In the past, I have provided all of your needs. I have, I have provided your nourishment. I have provided your food. And that's exactly what it was, Brother Eli. It was a past provision. And if we would dive deeper into the Ark of the Covenant, we would find a long stick. Probably look old and a little rugged. Might not look like there's much life to it. But just like that pot of manna, that old stick had seen its days. It's probably withered. It might even be warped from being laying in there and having no structure. But there would be Aaron's rod. You remember Aaron's rod? The one that budded? God was looking for a group to be his people there in the wilderness. Not just his people in general, but he was looking for his leadership. Who would lead my people spiritually? And there all 12 tribes took the staffs from the leader. 
the man who was in charge of that room. And they took it in. There it is.